That's another thing where I'm not sure if people actually care about gigantism or if they're using it as a proxy for other things that they don't like. Like, I could totally imagine a Well, person... I care about it. Sure, so... yeah, you might. Yeah, sorry. I, it just That's okay. in general, That's yeah. That's okay. Um, because, <clears throat> like, I could imagine somebody saying that, like, they don't trust, like, a large government, they think there's too much, uh, you know, prone to tyranny or something like that, but also be supportive of an institution like the Catholic Church, which is literally, you know, one guy who has a direct right, line to God. Right, but they can't tax. Um, well, I mean, there's... And they don't have a military. That and is... And they can't conscript you. True, right? yeah. And they can't throw you in jail. That is true. Stop! Stop! He's already dead. <laughs> Gang, what you're about to see is an absolute masterclass on how to handle a pugnacious woke leftist in issue after issue after issue. I'm Dr. Steve, your patron professor, and we're going to analyze how Jordan Peterson literally dismantled left-wing propaganda so that you can do the same. I think it's pretty undeniable at this point that there is an impact on climate across the planet. I, just I think that's highly deniable. We have no idea what the impact is from. We don't know where the carbon dioxide is from. We can't measure the warming of the oceans. We have terrible temperature records going back 100 years. Almost all the terrestrial temperature uh, 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 detection sites were first put outside urban areas. And then as and then the, right, and then you have to warm. correct, then you have to correct for the for the movement of the urban areas. And then you introduce an error parameter that's larger than the purported increase in temperature that you're planning to measure. This isn't data, this is guess. And there's something weird underneath it. There's something weird that isn't oriented well towards human beings underneath it. It has this guise of compassion. Oh, we're gonna save the poor in the future. It's like, that's what the bloody communists said. And they killed a lot of people doing it. And we're walking down that same road now with this insistence that, you know, we're so compassionate that we care about the poor a hundred years from now. And if we have to wipe out several hundred million of them now, well, that's a small price to pay for the future utopia. And we've heard that sort of thing before. And the alternative to that is for, is to stop having global level elites plot out a utopian future or even an anti-dystopian future. And that's exactly what's happening now with organizations like the WEF. And if this wasn't immediately impacting the poor in a devastating manner, I wouldn't care about it that much, but it is. You know, I watched over the course of the last five years, the estimates of the number of people who were in serious danger of food privation rise from about 100 million to about 350 million. That's a major price to pay for a little bit of, what, what would you say, for for progress on the climate front that's so narrow it can't even be measured. I don't think the increase in, in hungry people on the in the planet is because of climate policies. Why not? Think, because, because I don't think that countries in Africa are being pushed away from fossil fuels. I mean, most developing nations- Of course nations they are. are. They, can't get, they can't even get loans from the World Bank to produce, for, per, pursue fossil fuel development. And there's plenty of African leaders who are screeching at the top of their lungs about that because the elites in the West have decided that, well, it was okay for us to use fossil fuel for, so that we wouldn't have to starve to death and our children had some opportunities, but maybe the starving masses that are too large a load for the world anyways, shouldn't have that opportunity. And that's, that's direct policy from the UN fostered by organizations like the w, WEF. They're gonna have to turn to renewables. Yeah, well, good luck with that. Yeah, good luck with that, bucko. By the way, that's the, the far leftist YouTuber named Destiny. Uh, now, what Peterson said there is absolutely right. The African entrepreneur Maget Wade has long sounded the alarm on how the World Bank simply won't give any loans to African ventures precisely because they don't have the prerequisite green initiatives that the WEF, the World Economic Forum, insists on. And so as a result, the cost of energy and resources have soared for Africans, all the while unemployment and starvation increase. And so the way around that is to get energy and resources at the lowest possible cost as rapidly as possible to the largest number of people around the world. That's what Peterson, in effect, is advocating here. And here he's echoing the work of the Danish statistician Bjorn Lomberg and Marion Tupi, the Cato Institute, and many others who all recognize that technological progress and environmental health are not at odds. That innovation, particularly voluntary entrepreneurial innovation, is the key to solving environmental issues, not top-down government mandates, which in the end are just doomed to fail. Lombard in particular has pointed out that even if we did everything in the Paris Accord, everything, every single thing required, all of that effort 
would, would amount to a reduction in temperature by the end of the century to no more than 0.5 degrees Celsius. And to add insult to injury, those futile efforts make the vast majority of the world's population poor and put hundreds of millions of people in a state of food insecurity. So Peterson and a number of others are proposing the precise opposite. Let's push for industrialization and technological innovation to continue to lift populations out of poverty, like we've seen happen, for example, in China and Singapore, and are now seeing in nations like Rwanda, interestingly enough, while at the same time investing in all kinds of alternative green energies that will be voluntarily and widely embraced if found to be cheaper, cleaner, and more abundant than fossil fuels. So, you know, Hitler's cover story was that he wanted to make the glorious Third Reich and elevate the Germans to the highest possible status for the longest possible period of time. Okay, but that wasn't the outcome. The outcome was that Hitler shot himself through the head after he married his wife, who died from poison the same day, in a bunker underneath Berlin while Europe was in flames, while he was insisting that the Germans deserved exactly what they got because they weren't the noble people he thought they were. And then you might say, well, Hitler's plans collapsed in flames, and wasn't that a catastrophe? Or you could say, that was exactly what he was aiming for from the beginning, because he was brutally resentful and miserable right from the time he was, you know, a rejected artist at the age of 16. And so he was working, or something was working within him, and something that might well be regarded as demonic, whose end goal was precisely what it attained, which was the devastation of hundreds of millions of people, and Europe left in a smoking ruin. And the cover story was the Grand Third Reich. And so there's no reason at all to assume that we're not in exactly the same situation right now. I think there's a great reason to assume. I think that Hitler's motives and everything that he was trying to do wasn't a secret. I, like, I don't think that anybody had to guess that he was incredibly anti-Semitic, that his secret, Aryan supremacy secret, was going to lead to the destruction and the murder of like so many different people in concentration camps. Like, none of this was a secret. It's not like he was hiding it. Um, he to some extent. I mean, like, he, well, he tried to all, maybe hide the water. death camps, but nobody in Germany was wondering, like, wow, crazy the pogroms are happening as Jewish people. That's so crazy. Or, wow, they're all being shipped to just mainly the Jews to camps to work, like that's kind of interesting. Or wow, he talks about this a lot in Mein Kampf, but maybe it's just a coincidence. Uh, I don't think you can compare like Hitler to people that are worried about climate change. The worry that I Why have here not? is because if we're applying this- People thought, hit people in Germany thought Hitler was perfectly motivated by the highest of benevolent- uh, if, I would, if I were to take this standard of evidence and apply this lens of analysis, couldn't I say the exact same thing about the conservative constellation of belief? They don't want to intervene anywhere in the world because they don't care about the problems there. Uh, they're anti-immigration because they hate brown people. Trump wanted to ban Muslims from coming to the United States because he's xenophobic. Uh, conservatives uh, don't want to have taxes to help the poor because they want homeless people to starve and, and die in the winter. Uh, but like, I feel like if I- Some if of that's true. Now, I play that uh, because first I love how he confronted him with, oh, you, you, can't, you, you, can't, you can't compare people who are concerned about climate change with Hitler. <laughs> and Peterson's just like, why not? Why not? <laughs> but that exchange is very illuminative of how ignorant this fellow destiny is in the analysis of worldviews. What he fails to recognize is that Nazism, fascism, and the like are all distinctively modern political systems. In other words, political ideologies such as fascism, communism, and yes, Western liberalism all come out of the 18th century Enlightenment and its quest for a universal political and economic system. In other words, a one-size-fits-all political and economic system that could be imposed upon the entire world. And what we basically got were three options coming out of modernity. Three universal contenders, Western liberalism, Soviet communism, and Nazi fascism. And what Peterson is simply pointing out there is that such activism and its efforts to, quote, save the planet have a lot in common with the universal utopias envisioned by modernist sentiments that ended up being cataclysmically disastrous. That's his point. The contemporary conservative movement, as embodied by MAGA and the various European so-called far-right parties, by contrast, are postmodern. They're, they overtly reject the universal aspirations of modernity and instead embrace the geographic specificity of nation, culture, custom, and tradition. And so while that embrace can run into its own problems, for sure, humans never fail to disappoint, those problems do not pose anywhere near the potential for global catastrophe as modernist movements, of which environmentalism is one of the worst.
Hey gang, have you ever wanted to explore historical cities with a group of courageous patriots? Well, now's your chance to embark on an exclusive adventure with me, Dr. Steve, and other patriots like you as we set sail on the Mediterranean. You are invited to join us this August on Royal Caribbean's luxury liner, The Voyager of the Seas. You get to spend time with me and other like-minded patriots during live onboard classes as we dive into topics like the rising parallel economy and the culture wars and how you can share my optimism in conservative renewal. We'll discover enchanting architecture, timeless artistry, and breathtaking experiences as we adventure through Spain, France, and Italy. Enjoy incredible dining experiences, enriching education, and once-in-a-lifetime attractions each day of our journey. It'll be a summer you'll simply never forget. Join me and your fellow patriots this August 5th to 12th for this unparalleled adventure. And if you want more information and want to take part in our last-minute pricing sale, my team is waiting to talk to you right now. Just click on that link below. There are only a handful of cabins left, so don't wait. Click on that link below or go to cruiseinfo.turleytalks.com to learn more. Gang, this is going to be an unforgettable trip, and I can't wait to spend it with you. Click on that link below right now. But the other obviously glaring possibility is that injecting billions of people with a vaccine that was not tested by any stretch of the imagination with the thoroughness that it should have before it was forced upon people also might be a contributing factor. Partly we, because we know that it led to a rise in myocarditis among young men. And we also know that there was absolutely no reason whatsoever to ever recommend that that vaccine was delivered to young children. So whose there, risk of death at COVID was so close to zero that it might as well have been not, zero. When you're talking about a disease, the risk of death isn't the only thing that you worry about for the disease. Also so you're going to talk about transmission? We, well, because we, that we was another about, thing that the we can talk COVID about vaccine transmission. pushed. Yeah, we but can, it didn't do anything we to can transmission. Talk, it absolutely did because it decreased your chance of getting infected. It didn't destroy, it didn't get rid of transmission, but it reduced transmission. Yeah, but it was your claimed that it would get rid of only transmission. Only if you take one reading of one single quote, I think that oh, Biden said one time where he said, no, come on, Biden one time on the news said, if you get the vaccine, you won't transfer the so disease, silly. which was it. And so everybody talks about freedom and not to have a to have a shot or have a test. Well, guess what? And so how about patriotism? How about making sure that you're vaccinated so you do not spread the disease to anybody else? What about that? What's the big deal? No. Do you know that our prime minister in Canada deprived Canadians of the right to travel for six months because the unvaccinated were going to transmit COVID with more likelihood than the than the vaccinated. So this wasn't one bloody statement. This I, was no, like no, hold on. thorough I, what government I, what policy I'm, What I'm saying country. is there wasn't a statement given that if you get vaccinated, there is a 0% chance of transmitting the disease. The idea is that vaccines were supposed to help because Fine, it, well, reduces, it reduces we, your hospitalization, <laughs> it reduces death, and it reduces transmission, hopefully by making it so that people don't get sick or don't get sick for as long. All three of those things, the vaccines did exceedingly well. They, um, they were well, tested. The myocarditis rates are like seven out of 100,000 injections. And the myocarditis is generally acute. And it's generally not as bad as even getting the coronavirus itself, which will lead you also to having myocarditis. It's a much worse side effect than side effects that have caused other vaccines to be taken off the market before. That so, a but seven it, out of 100,000 rate of acute myocarditis or pericarditis is not a worse uh, side effect than any other vaccine. I think that is a completely acceptable, given that the disease itself is more likely to cause myocarditis or pericarditis. Yes, I don't think totally the data suggests to support that presupposition anymore. The latest peer-reviewed studies show that that's simply not true, especially among young men. I told you at the beginning of this conversation that the progressive leftists were on the side of the pharmaceutical companies. It's not about being on the side of the pharmaceutical companies. It's about really one. Really, yeah. It's yeah. Well, about, I like, see. So what I see, uh, what I see as the unholy part of that alliance with the pharmaceutical companies is that it dovetails with the radical utopians' willingness to use power to impose their utopian vision. Well, then what do you because make otherwise, of the fact how that would you explain it? Because the leftists should have been the ones that were most skeptical about the bloody pharmaceutical companies. And they jumped on the vaccine bandwagon in exactly the same way that you're doing I mean, right pharmaceutical now. Pharmaceutical companies have helped us tremendously yeah, throughout the Right, day. there we go. Fine. No, do you think modern I don't medicine think hasn't? so. No, I don't think that so. You're just wrong. I think they're you're utterly wrong. I see. So you don't think that the pharmaceutical companies who dominate the advertising landscape with 75% of the funding are corrupt? I don't. Corrupt is a corrupt. very broad. No, no, no. no, no it's 
Do you think that? Do you think that pharmacy, corrupt do you think with they, a tinge of malevolence? Do you think willing that, to extract money out of people by putting their health on the line? Do you, you don't think believe that, we, that? Do you think that we get effective drugs from pharmaceutical companies? Not particularly. Wow, that was quite the exchange. But the beauty of it all was how Peterson in the end just exposed this liberal as little more than a shell for big pharma. And this is all part of what we often talk about on this channel. It's all part of what scholars call the rise of refutalization, where our society is increasingly resembling the kind of caste system akin to the class structure of the Middle Ages. So at one level, we've got a massive amount of power and wealth being accumulated and centralized in the hands of very, very few people made up of billionaires and bureaucrats. But at another level, we're seeing today a comparable kind of religious fanaticism, not through a clerical class, not through the church, but through what's called a clerisy class, a pseudo-intellectual class dedicated to woke fanaticism made up of race and gender and sex. And these twin dynamics are shaping what scholars increasingly call a neo-feudalized society, where bureaucrats and billionaires are teaming up to create a top-down governance structure that's accumulating unprecedented levels of power and influence. But at the same time that's happening, we're seeing more and more billionaires and bureaucrats enforcing a highly woke, dogmatic ideology that's designed to destroy any legitimate basis for dissent. And so the key here is that radical woke fanaticism actually protects the power and affluence of the billionaire and bureaucrat by silencing any and all opposition to neo-feudalized dynamics. And that's exactly what Jordan Peterson exposed for all of us to see in this liberal who's now all about shilling for the billionaires that have created a tyrannical social pyramid enforced by the forced compliance of wokeness. Unfortunately for them, there are a whole lot of us who are dissenting from this tyranny and forced compliance, and nowhere do we see that dissent more consistently and impressively displayed than in the rhetorical brilliance of Jordan Peterson. Thank <laughs> you.